We'll transition to our, uh, to our next speaker. So I want to introduce uh, Michael Bayer. So Mike uh, is from um, Rockwell Automation. He's the Global Portfolio Director, Director for the Lifecycle Services business. He has strategic responsibility for the Lifecycle Services business, including network and cybersecurity services, workforce services, and asset optimization services. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Take the clicker. Good afternoon. I think I win for maybe longest title. <laughs> so let me explain what that, that title means and, and uh, who's up here talking to you and, and why I think I'm qualified to talk about the topic. Um, Rockwell is an industrial control company. You've heard of us, I'm sure, if you're in the manufacturing business, whether it's PLCs, networks, drives, or, or something else. We're also a services business, uh, and we have services that we do to augment uh, your manufacturing staff, your needs, et cetera. One of those areas that uh, we've been heavily invested in over the last 20 years is, is network security um, and, and network layout, network segmentation. And over the last decade, that's transitioned heavily into cybersecurity. Uh, so that's the portion of the portfolio that I lead uh, and why I think I'm qualified hopefully to address some of the, the topics that have been asked to discuss today, which is specifically what are the cybersecurity trends that we're facing in an OT environment. So first off, let me just qualify what I say OT manufacturing, right? On your plant floor, um, not up necessarily uh, in, in the C-level suites, uh, not in a, um, you know, I'm not gonna be addressing some of the IT space. My peer here from, from Cisco will talk about that next. But we're gonna talk about what happens down on that plant floor when we get down and dirty and we're trying to make uh, products, widgets, we're trying to, uh, to make the company money. And how does cybersecurity in that OT world collide. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the trends that we're seeing today. Uh, let's see here. Oh, apologize, I got a technical difficulty. All right, we'll talk a little bit about the trends that we're seeing, some statistics, a little bit of shock and awe. Uh, I think we're all gonna be throwing some data at you, which is probably gonna hopefully be compelling uh, enough for you to act, to do something different, to think different. Go back to your organizations. Uh, you, they were sent, you, you were sent here for a reason, you came here for a reason, we're trying to help you understand how to act different, how to think different. So we'll talk a little bit about those trends, see some of the statistics, and then I'll go into uh, what are the challenges. If we want to address those, those trends and it, it was easy, we wouldn't be talking today. You guys would already have this gap closed. So what are the challenges that we face in the OT space? Um, and then more importantly, we'll close with, well, what do we want to do about it? How can we drive change? Where would we start? Because uh, if you don't think about it from a, a pragmatic approach, you can be boiling uh, the ocean a little bit here and just get stuck and not even get off a top dead center. So we'll talk a little bit about a common framework that we see the industry use, uh, what we think at Rockwell is a best practice, and more importantly, how you can take that back to your organizations and hopefully drive some of those discussions and that change. All right, so first off, just a, a little bit of an eye chart here is, are the attacks happening, right? And, and what do they look like? Do they happen? in our backyard, or are these just happening at Fortune 100, Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies? The answer is, is they're happening right now. They're happening to us, they're happening to our competitors, they're happening to the, uh, the leaders of the markets, and they're happening to the people that are just scraping by. Um, you know, I, I, I joke that cybersecurity in, in that threat landscape is an equal opportunity attacker. They don't care who you are, they don't care what you do, they don't care what you make, they're gonna exploit you. Either intentionally or unintentionally, you are on their radar. And if we look at the trend here over the last decade, uh, the attacks are picking up. They're getting more sophisticated. I'm sure if you scour this list, you've heard some of these. Stuxnet, Black Energy, WannaCry, right? In 2017, ransomware became kind of a, a household thing for all of us. It became a household term and phrase. Uh, big corporations, whether it be Mondelez and, and the NotPetya uh, ransomware attack or, or some of the other ones, the adjunct general men already mentioned the Colonial Pipeline. These are becoming very commonplace. But what I want to leave you with, it's not just the big corporations, it's not just the critical infrastructure. There are uh, intentional and sophisticated attacks going after every sector of manufacturing. And there's unintentional attacks happening, coming our way. So you've got to think differently. The, uh, the trend is not going to slow down. If we look at it just from a critical infrastructure standpoint, when I saw this data point, frankly, it scared the hell out of me. 
This is critical infrastructure, so hospitals, water, wastewater, uh, utility grids, et cetera. The trend of attacks continues to increase. So obviously, uh, from an OT standpoint, from a governmental standpoint, when we think about um, compliance, et cetera, this is the place we start. But we can learn a lot because if they're aiming here, they're gonna start aiming farther up the supply chain. They're gonna start aiming at other areas that can make them money, right? That they can exploit from a ransomware standpoint. And the reality is the pandemic hasn't slowed this down, right? So since the pandemic, you can see the, the previous chart just has data through 2020. So we're, we're still trailing, right? We're still adding up all the, uh, the increases in 2021. But the reality is since the pandemic, we've seen an increase over 600%. I'm curious, why is that? What do you guys think? Sorry? Open RDP. Open RDP. What else? Work from, home. Work from home. Anything else? That's a big one that stops, you know, right where you're on your home, you're on your, your network, um, it might be secure, right? You're out of your IT's confines. What else? What happened in the pandemic? Did you guys stay in the same jobs? Did the people you work with stay in the same jobs? A lot of people taking different jobs, right? The great workforce uh, shift, right? People find you different jobs. So when you take a different job, you don't have that, uh, that skills, that knowledge, that education, that experience. You don't have that training. So now you might be unintentionally creating or increasing that threat landscape. So a lot has changed in the last two or three years. And guess what? The bad guys are paying attention. They're watching closely. They know uh, that this has changed. They know we're working from home. They know that we have new unseasoned people uh, watching over control systems, walking, watching over systems and processes and tech stack, and that, that's scary. And, and the reality is the real, the real reason why I think they're in it is they make money. They're doing the same thing we care about. They care about profit. They care about return on investment. It's a business case for them, and if you don't think that way, you're fooling yourself, right? We all think about ways we can make money, ways that we can make our shareholders more profitable, our bosses happy, make sure we have a paycheck, a good career, a good salary, a good pension, whatever drives you, it's almost always financially. That's how you're working. These folks are the exact same way, right? They're creating sophisticated attacks to make sure they can go make that money. $10 trillion by 2025 is what we're expecting to pay as a society. Guess how much we're spending a year right now in protecting ourselves? One trillion. Seems like a good investment to me. And the scary thing is that if you look back at those attacks in 2010, you know, in, in, in early 2000s, it was a, a smart kid out of college that made bad decisions, right? It was really intelligent people. It was more independent thinkers. Now those people are creating little kits and bots and things that probably was, you know, that could educate someone like me to go be a bad actor. They're making it simple and they're productizing the bad actors, which means that anyone then can go make money. Anyone, I don't wanna say it's, it's uh, anyone off the street, but you don't need to be the best uh, unethical hacker in the world to go do this today. You can go download toolkits and you can go do some of these ransomware attacks, do some of these bad things. And if you're not protected for it, you're going to get exploited. So rest assured guys, this is a business. This is the way these folks think about it. They are, they are doing this for a living and they could care less what it means to your businesses, what it means to our critical infrastructure and in the OT space that, that frankly scares the hell out of me. And it should scare you too. All right, so enough shock and awe. What, what do we wanna do about it? What's keeping us from snapping our fingers and addressing uh, these, these challenges, these trends that we're seeing over the last 10 years and the acceleration we've seen over the last few years? The first thing is if I put myself in the shoes of a, a leader, a decision maker, a CISO, a CIO, I have a lot of competing interests, right? I have to address a, a lot of things uh, all at once. People are trying to get my attention. They're trying to get my, uh, you know, my aspect, my, my, my funding. They're trying to get my resources. And if you look up here, this is a, a report from Gardner. This shows kind of the breakdown of the things that influence a CISO or a typical uh, infrastructure decision maker. You can see at the very top, physical systems, right? That's, a, that's obvious. Um, just the complexity of the systems, the longevity, the life cycle management of that plant network, of that industrial control, of the servers, of the process, that technology. That is a huge, huge uh, motivator and really a challenge for, for CISOs to worry about. Competing business initiatives, 
the fact that the threat landscape evolves, inf uh, what were we talking about on the sidebar? Infinite threat landscape, right? Now we're working from home. Well, guess what? Our mobile phones are now a new threat landscape that is much harder to control than if you uh, have that locked down in your plant. The, the lack of uh, VPN multi-factor, I mean, just that whole dynamic changes all the time. So we have to chase that. Um, the fact that we, we are doing more as a service in the cloud. How many things do you do today where you're using Teams, you're using SharePoint, you're using Google Drive, whatever it may be, information's being passed around in the cloud. You don't have control of that information, that data, that access anymore. These are all things that, that we have to worry about. So this is a challenge, like where do you start? How, how do you prioritize your funding, your money, your focus? We pulled 128 uh, CISOs that we have uh, access to in an advisory board and we boiled down their feedback of what keeps them up at night. How do they, how do they think about this, this cybersecurity problem and really what, what, uh, what's the compelling challenge from their perspective? And it came down to these four. Looks like we got more technical difficulties. Sorry about that, guys. Um, the first one is just the complexity um, of the threats. If you think about our manufacturing facilities, very, very often we build that plant and it's around for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm not sure about you, but it's, it's very often that we get a new capital uh, project where we can do a new process line. We can do an overall. So you're gonna have this uh, legacy of different process, technology, sometimes people, in your manufacturing environments. That makes it really hard to control. You might have a legacy network, you might have the best network, you might have everything in between. How do you manage all that? The threat landscape for each of those solutions, each portions of your plant might be totally different. I mentioned the sophisticated tax earlier, right? Two thirds of our tax are actually as a service. Again, that means someone's thinking about this as a business. Someone has productized it, someone else is using it to make money. The threats are changing, they're emerging. Uh, our IIoT, the fact that we want everything connected in the plant so we can get better uh, productivity, we can avoid downtime, we can get better yield, better throughput, whatever KPI your leader is driving you to, a lot of that drives intelligence down into the plant floor. Well, that intelligence needs connectivity, right? To do your analytics, to do your, um, your, improve, your process improvement. Well, that intelligence can be hacked, right? That intelligence can be used against us if we're not careful. So the, the reality here is that this is, this is a challenge to go fix. Now, the good news is we can do something about it. So there's a pragmatic way to think differently. Uh, but like we did 20 years ago with safety uh, in our environments, we have to start at the top. We've got to start from a culture standpoint. Sorry guys, I don't know why the text isn't showing up, that's okay. Um, from, an, from an organization standpoint, the culture matters. If you don't have leaders bought into this, if you don't have your CEO and their vision statement doesn't call out something about security, cybersecurity, and, and really why that's part of the mission statement, you're probably not gonna be successful. For all those reasons we just talked about, this is hard, We've got complex networks, complex solutions we've got to address. There's competing funding requests. Lot, uh, very often cybersecurity is seen as competing against productivity, competing against getting products out the door. Uh, it can't be seen that way. And that starts at the top. That starts at the leadership, the decision, the C-suite, whatever you want to call it. If they're not bought into cybersecurity, the rest of the organization won't follow. And if you think about some of the challenges we face, right, I'll pick on IT, OT, this convergence that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, the reality is it's not that we don't like each other. The reality is, is we care about different things from a different angle. So up here you can see kind of the um, top to bottom, right, from decision maker all the way down to the people looking after the assets, the different things they care about. And, and I like to think about the folks in IT caring about um, the flow of the data. That's their KPI, that's what keeps them up at night. They wanna make sure that their system, their server, their network and compute assets, whatever it may be, it's configured, it's up to date, it has the right patches, it's gonna keep the data flowing. That is what keeps them uh, ticking, that's what their objectives are, and that's what really when at the end of the year they can look their boss in the eye and say, I did my job. On the other side of the fence, the OT folks that are responsible for that plant floor, they gotta keep the products flowing. So it's not data anymore, it's product. It might be diapers, it might be steel, it might be uh, wood pulp, whatever, whatever your industry, your application is, you're making something to make money. 
right? And your job is to keep that thing going. Sometimes that's 24 seven. And, and the conflict that we often see in this IT OT area is, well, I gotta keep the data flowing, which means in order to, I, I will say patch a firewall, right? Or patch a, a network and compute device, a server. There's a vulnerability that was exposed and I've gotta keep the data flowing. So I've gotta bring the network down to go patch it. Well, the OT team is gonna look at it and say, absolutely not. I've got to hit my fiscal year end, my month year end output. I've got to make the diapers. We're behind, we've got backlog. Haven't you seen the pandemic numbers, right? We've got to ship things to, to customers. Don't you care about our financial results? That's where that conflict comes in. So culturally, we have to drive a different dialogue. We have to talk about an end, not an or. We can't talk about those being one or the other. It's not binary, it's gotta be great. How do you do patch management at the right time and not bring the OT environment to its knees? How do you keep that product flowing and the data flowing at the same time? If you don't have the culture um, to, to really have that open and honest dialogue and work through that conflict, you'll get stuck. And you either won't keep the data flowing or you won't keep the product flowing. And worse off, you'll do that and you'll still have the same vulnerabilities that we talked about and you'll be up on that list next time we talk. So this is really important. And if you don't start here, the rest falls apart. So let's pretend we have the culture. We're having the dialogue, right? Our ITOT, our leaders are talking about this. We've got funding, we've got attention, we've got focus, it's in our vision statement. We're singing Kumbaya. So what do we do now? Where do we start? Do we put badge readers on all the doors to the server room? Um, or do we go bring in some, uh, some uh, ethical hackers to do tabletops and pen testing? You know, it's, you're boiling the ocean here. So how do you start? Um, and, and this is just as complex for a small client as it is for a big client. You still have to go through a pragmatic way of thinking. What we like to think about is using a framework. Um, we use something similar, you know, 20 years ago when safety was being introduced, functional safety and machine safety and personnel safety into plants. Uh, do you start with light curtains and machine guarding or do you start with training? Like, how do you do that? Well, again, think about your risk from a, a safety standpoint and get pragmatic about it. So we, use, we, we suggest using a framework uh, that's referred to as NIST framework. It's, it's governed by the National Instru Instrumentation of Standards and Technology. This is a well-known framework. I'm curious who in the room knows about NIST. Okay, good. That's, a, that's actually better than typical. So the first off is just awareness. Understanding this framework and how it applies to your threat landscape, to your industry, to your business, to your plant floor, to your O&T environment is where you gotta start. So we talk about uh, the framework of how to, how to get secure or more increase your security, your, your hygiene uh, before the attack. We talk about a framework for um, making sure we're protected before, you know, during the attack. And then how do you recover? How do you remediate? So we'll go through these, these here just at a high level. Again, I'm not gonna go into grave detail, but I just wanna open up the door and tease out these, these steps, this framework a little bit so that you guys can think a little bit differently as you go back to your day jobs. The first one is identifying the assets. Very often we talk to, again, small, large, medium firms that don't understand what their threat landscape is. They don't know how many mobile phones their, their, uh, their folks have. They don't know how many IIoT devices they have. They don't know how, the ser how many servers they have. They don't know where those servers are located. They don't know what generation they are, what patches do they have. Uh, or not have. So you just have to understand that identifying that assets and the threat landscape, really what those bad actors can exploit is step one. So that's a lot based on asset inventory, different types of assessments, whether it be a network assessment or risk assessment or vulnerability assessment. There's all different flavors that you can identify and, and really understand where your threat landscape is. But first is awareness. You can't really go chase um, becoming more secure as, a, as, a, as an OT in, environment without understanding where your potential problems are. So we strongly suggest starting here, and again, you don't have to iterate here, you don't have to spend three, five years here, but if you don't start here, how do you really know the right place to aim? Next up is protect. Once you understand where those threat, what that threat landscape looks like, where those assets are, how do you start to protect them? For the last 20, 15, 20 years, the OT environment's been focused, very focused on network segmentation, network layout. So we've talked about things like the Purdue model, 
We've put in air gaps to make sure you know, we can't access the OT environment, make sure that uh, we, we don't have line of sight to the critical assets. That's good, but the reality is, is the game has changed over the last 10 years, and even with air gaps and, and laying out a great network, you still can be exploited. So you gotta go above and beyond that. You gotta think about, well, now when I'm working from home, how do I get access to that critical information? Because I gotta keep the product flowing, but how do I do that in a secure way? So even if I have a, a well laid out network, I still have holes, I still have flaws, I still have use cases that I have to consider. So thinking through things like backup and data recovery plans, when a server goes down, how do you recover from that? It's not really a cybersecurity event, but you still have to be ready for it. How do you access information remotely? So expanding your horizons from network layout when you think about protecting those assets that you just identified is a key step. Once you have the, the information identified and protected, well, now how do you start to detect the intrusions? All right, this is where uh, software uh, solutions and, and managed services come in around like threat detection. So if you've heard that to term, that is a, a, uh, a solution that's looking at data in your, in the, the data flow in your system, in your industrial control system, and it's inspecting that data flow for intrusions. We're looking for things like uh, bad network traffic, anomalous network traffic, packets that um, shouldn't be coming from one place to another, ports that are being exploited, PLC changes that shouldn't have happened, authentication uh, requests into HMIs or server rooms that you know, are anomalous or people have failed attempts. We're watching over as a threat detection system to make sure we're catching and alerting uh, really you as a client what that looks like. And there's a couple different ways you can go about this protection. You can have someone give you a solution and you have the domain expertise to manage it, or you can just say, take care of it. I, I don't wanna have those people, I don't have the bandwidth, I don't have the staff, I don't have the budget, I want you to come and deploy this, and I want you to manage it. And we often refer to that as a security operations center, a SOC, as a service. So again, this is where we have to meet our, our, our customers at their journey from a security standpoint. And we find very often that as you assess and identify your assets and you think about protecting them and you get to this stage, this is where it gets capital uh, and in intensive from a labor standpoint. This is where you need domain expertise. And a lot of times this is very pivotal uh, in the OT space because you either go all in on establishing a SOC and hiring the experts, uh, or you look to offload some of that to a partner. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky, but this is an important step, because if you stop short of here, you've identified your resources and you've protected them, but we're still gonna have uh, intrusions, are we, that, threat, that infinite threat landscape, you can't protect everything. So you gotta be able to detect. Even with detection and protection and identification, they're still gonna get in. I, I talked about Mondelez earlier with the ransomware. They have an incredible uh, uh, SOC. They have incredible cybersecurity domain expertise. They understand their threat landscape. They still got hacked with that ransomware. So you have to be ready and know how to respond. The adjunct general talked about this earlier, right? If you, if you have your, your, uh, your cheat sheet for your response plan on your server, on your network, and you can't access it, what good does it do? So tabletop exercises, working with firms to go through a what if scenarios, that is the type of planning you need to do. And again, do you go right here? No, because right? if you come right here, you don't even understand your threat landscape. But you have to think this way because if you don't understand how to respond, well, then you're gonna be protected. You might even detect it, but you don't know how to react. So you, working with different partners, you can understand how you would go through innocent response. You can have insurance coverage. You can have uh, cybersecurity firms on retainer, right, where they swoop in and they come, they actually fly in within 24 hours and they wrap caution tape around the server rooms and they start shutting everything down, containing, mitigating, helping you get back up to speed. So you gotta think through what that plan looks like. And the last thing I'll mention here is recovering. A lot of times when we think about recovery, it's getting the servers back up to, uh, to running, it's configuring the patches, it's recovering the data. What I would argue you should think about as OT manufacturing folks is how do you get that, how do you get that OT environment back up and running? If you're a continuous process, what does that look like? How do you get the drives up and running, the PLCs, the HMI? Where, what, do you have startup procedures for all your maintenance staff to go from catastrophic failure to go? Very often we don't because we've kept that running over years and decades and we've added on to it. 
So part of that remediation plan and really understanding how to recover from a very catastrophic hack is thinking about this from an OT lens. Do I have spares? Do I have backups? What happens if someone brings the network down and the machinery actually uh, breaks, right? Do you have that expensive gearbox? Do you have the, the blueprints ready to go? Can you actually replicate some of those? Again, thinking comprehensively about what your, get your backup and running looks like. And I, I like to think about this from a personal standpoint, right? We have, uh, if you have families, you think about your fire drills, where do we meet outside? What do we do in a tornado? Okay, you should also be thinking about, well, what do you do if the, everything gets wiped out and you don't have access to your insurance cards, your passports, your, uh, your savings account number? How do you get access to all that? A lot of us have a plan there, I hope. It's very similar in the EOT environment. It's not just about bringing the data back on loan. How do you get that product flowing in the EOT space? So thinking about that is, is certainly key. I mentioned earlier about the skills gap, right? People are taking different jobs, a lot of, a lot of uh, workforces of retirement age, so we're seeing a huge turnover in, in skills right now. Additionally, oh, just having all sorts of, uh, I think when we copy and paste the slides in, we maybe lost some data, so I apologize for that. So I think this one is 78% of CISOs feel that they have too much complexity in their industrial control systems, too many networks, too many different uh, legacy PLCs, legacy drives, HMIs, whatever you may have, just a lot of complexity. So now we have workforce that's retiring. We have new people that have come on and not trained. They're using really complex systems. Well, how do you work through that? What it looks like if I'm a, um, if I'm a SOC cybersecurity engineer, this is what it looks like to me. It looks like white noise. Kind of looks like my, maybe my email inbox before I started letting Google filter out all my junk, right? I'm getting tons and tons of noise. I'm, I'm getting uh, information around alerts and events from my network. I'm getting access, uh, you know, that looks different. Hey, where someone accessed the server room on a night or a weekend. Um, I, I'm getting production changes. Hey, this PLC changed from RON to remote mode. This drive went from, uh, you know, one speed to another. I have no clue if that's good, bad, or ugly. Right, this is, this is noise to me. So figuring out how you take this data and make it insights and draw conclusions. What do you need to address? What do you need not to address? What do you ignore? What's your junk folder look like? Is tricky, it's really tricky, but it's possible. This is a case study that we did for one of our manufacturing plants down in Ohio. And you can see after about two months, this is just looking at Threat detection alerts. So this is just one form of alert. This is in firewalls, this is an antivirus, this is an endpoint protection. This is simply looking at network threat detection alerts. 435,000 alerts would have swarmed to that SOC. Two, three people looking at that. A lot of white noise. If you take that and go from 150 down to five, how do you contextualize that information? How do you throw out the white noise? How do you ignore the spam? And then how do you start to know what's actually legitimately okay? That PLC change that happened right there, that was intentional. We're actually trying out a new recipe for the diaper, right? We're actually doing something different for the galvanizing line. And then additionally, we wanna get down to actually uh, five insights where the, the client, the SOC uh, operator knows they need to do something. This is actually bad, right? We had five things that were concerning, either intentional or unintentional intrusions, We've got to go plug those holes. We've got to go patch that server. We've got to go keep the product flowing, but address the data flowing as well. So the trick here is, is figuring out how do you employ cybersecurity solutions across that NIST framework and make sure you don't get stuck up in the top where you're ignoring your processes you put in place, your technology you put in place, because it's just white noise. And that's a constant challenge we see, not only in OT, but in IT as well. So last two slides is, is what would we suggest? How do you start? I would start with a business and evaluation. Again, it's that culture. Are you thinking about this as a return on investment? Don't think about this as, a, as an opportunity to spend money in some other place that conflicts with um, your ability to hit your, your process, your, your KPIs that you care about. Think about this differently. This is how you maintain the longevity of those KPIs. This is how you keep your diaper is rolling off your diaper line for the next 20 years, right? And if you think about it that way from a business standpoint, it's an ROI. It's a protection of your investment. It's a protection of your manufacturing environment. You got to look at technology, that identification of the assets, understanding how you protect them. Do you partner with people? Do you have the IT domain expertise? Can they become OT domain expertise? 
Can they think differently? Or do you want to partner with someone outside? You have to understand that technical decision and decide whether it's inside, outside, or a hybrid model. And then organizationally, are you aligned, right? Or do you have the right leaders? Do you have the right decision makers buy-in? Do you have a group that actually is intentionally driving uh, alignment between IT and OT? Or are you just gonna let that conflict fester and make, make two decisions in a vacuum? So you have to think about this as a business, you gotta assess the technology, and you gotta look within organizationally and see if you're ready uh, for this journey. The last thing I'll leave you with is as you go through this, you're undoubtedly going to think about partners. Very few firms will actually say, we're going to do all this on our own. I, I, even Fortune 100 companies don't do all this on their own. They don't want to have a 500 person SOC that has expertise in everything. As you think about your partner, I would challenge you to think a little bit differently. Don't think about that partner as someone that's gonna come and give you a technical solution and walk out the door, and that sales guy's gonna call you, you know, once a month, once a year, and see how it's going. That technology partner better be deeper than that. They better be a true partner. They better be assessing your threat landscape with you. They better be helping you with that business evaluation, that technical evaluation, evaluation and driving that organizational change. And, and challenge that partner and ask how they're gonna help you assess your security journey from that framework standpoint. And if they can't answer those questions, I don't think you got the right partner. All right, that's all I have. I appreciate the time. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, open up for questions. I hear you talk a lot about uh, operations. Are you looking at it from a uh, manufacturing standpoint and not considering front office stuff? Or are you considering the holistic approach where you're looking at, I have the manufacturing uh, networks running. I also have a front end office with HR and you know, all the other fun stuff. And those networks can collide. And are you looking? Are you providing solutions then for the front office as well, or are you looking only for the uh, manufacturing side? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question, make sure everyone. So, when we talk about the threat landscape, and tell me if I characterize it wrong, when we talk about the threat landscape, is it the manufacturing environment, the manufacturing network, or do we talk about the front office network, HR, personnel, finance, payroll? It's got to be all in. It, it has to be all in. It doesn't matter. And if I and if I led you astray on that, I apologize. Um, your question is, does, does Rockwell think comprehensively? Yes, I'm not here to sell you on Rockwell stuff. I'm here to challenge you guys, it has to be all in. Don't think just OT, right? Because if you got the, the ability to keep your diapers going out the line, but you don't, can't pay your workers because the payroll network's down, guess what, those, those people aren't coming to work. So it has to be all in. Again, when you assess that partner to think about your threat landscape across the NIST framework, they better be talking to you about the networks in the front office, the networks in the OT space, the IT space. They better be assessing your supply chain as well, right? Because guess what? If you're, if you're the people that are giving you the, um, the, the, the products to make your product, right? The ASICs, the steel, the diaper, the paper, whatever it is, if they don't have uh, a cybersecurity hygiene plan, and if they don't understand their threat landscapes, then that's a vulnerability for you. So you got you got to be thinking comprehensively. Now again, that's that's scary. That's a boil of the ocean. Like I get paralyzed by that when I think about really how to drive that. But you got to be thinking about that pragmatically through the NIST framework. And then where do you want to start? How do you identify those assets, those vulnerabilities, and how do you chip away at it? Right. Now we extend into every. Uh, I shouldn't say every. That's a general term. But most operating systems are out there at Microsoft. And uh, zero day vulnerabilities are a very real thing. And they come up with great frequency nowadays. Um, some could argue that it came because of solar winds um, uh, supply chain attack and, and people running around with networks. And, and as people now are starting to become aware, by the time you're aware that you've truly been intruded, you could have had three quarters of a year of that intrusion before you know. All your IP is probably in China right now or in Russia. I don't mean that as a, as a joke, it's, it's reality. And uh, when we assess these and look at the NIST framework for creating what is our attack vectors or our threat levels, by the time you're done, the one really that I have is everything is run off of a couple of software vectors. And we're at the 
mercy of what has been created that allows for us to use. So we spend our time patching the people that are supposed to be protecting us with the patches. So it becomes kind of like a never ending circle. Hey, chasing your tail continuously. Hopefully you guys heard, heard the commentary because it was, it was spot on, right? So if you're dependent upon different software vendors to run your back office, your front office, your OT environment, you're at the mercy of their security hygiene. You're at the mercy of how robust they are. It's choosing, you're choosing your tech stack partners. What I would say, right, is, is identifying those vulnerabilities, right? Identifying and, and figuring out how to protect. Are you, are you subscribing to Threat Intel feeds where you actually see those zero day vulnerabilities in real time? When you see them, do you know which assets are actually using that software? Do you have a plan to go patch that quickly and plug that hole fast? Do you have a plan to announce to your customers that might be exploited because your software got exploited? It's a trickle down effect of supply chain. If you don't think through that, guess what, your customers are gonna be frustrated with you if you handed them part of the problem, just like you're frustrated with Microsoft. So it goes back to that NIST framework. It's not just thinking about the asset identification protecting, you have to have that remediation plan, right? I'll give you an example from a Rockwell standpoint, we make network and compute devices, right? Those network compute devices are servers, they have operating systems, we're watching, right? When we see those zero day vulnerabilities, we need to be able to respond in real time and go tell our clients where they're exposed and we need to be able to patch them. We need to keep that data flowing and sometimes it does impact the OT environment. Our clients aren't happy with us, but you know we're exposing them to vulnerabilities because we're depending upon that tech stack. We have to have a plan as a company to, to mitigate that risk as much as possible and then automate and very efficiently respond to it. It's no different than all of you, just at a different perspective. So yeah, it's, it's part of the supply chain, the tech stack, um, Correlation, that's that circle, circular uh, uh, chasing your tail aspect. It's real. Good point. One, one more comment. Sure. If I may. Um, there are different classifications of computer systems that provide the redundancies necessary to recover quickly from cyber or ransomware attacks. If I'm not mistaken, General Nat said that he was working with Boeing. I think Boeing has one of the few certified redundant computer systems that actually need NISD requirements for a lot of cybersecurity um, standards, and it's all built into the operating system. Now, Boeing has the resources to provide that and created that system. I don't think it's a, I think it's a specialized system that they created. We, we don't have those types of resources, so we're kind of stuck with um, understanding that we need to protect against cybersecurity, but the key incident that we talked about was how do you recover? I still have an FBI case open from 2019. They never responded to me to my IC3 request. And uh, we, had, we got into the ransom. Unfortunately, I was able to recover in about six hours, but still, it was a big problem. So um, reporting is, a, is an issue. And I know that uh, we had to talk about earlier. Um, I think the gentleman back here asked, where do we find, where is this like that? I'll use an example. If I have a problem on my computer, I'm asked to go to the, to the uh, uh, network or the internet and find these amongst community boards. Is there a community board for this type of stuff that we can, as a, as a collective, just dump our information and how we uh, work on that? Now, I believe a general map said that that's something that's going to be, you know, to look forward to with our um, going forward. It's just, it's just a lot of things to think about. It's not just simply, you're not a simple little you you said a lot there to unpack. <laughs> I, what, I, what I would what I would say, and hopefully everyone could hear the gentleman. I, you have to meet um, your cybersecurity needs where you're at in your journey. If you're Boeing, yeah, you're probably going to have the investment to have a fully digital twin ready uh, cybersecurity solution. If you're not in your mom and pop shop in northern Wisconsin. I don't think you need that. But you gotta have elements of this because you still need to be prepared, right? I don't think you need a fully redundant backup system, but thinking about your assets, thinking about your threat landscape, being intentional about where you spend your money and how you evolve your threat landscape and your, th your hygiene, your cybersecurity hygiene over the next few years, that's my challenge to you. Other questions, comments? We do none time. I wanna put a comment on a lot of that was the, um, Agreed. I think that it comes, I think you use the term resilience. And you know, when you talk about 
cybersecurity, I think a big piece of that is your resiliency, right? Because no matter how good you are, some they're going to get in. There are going to be threats. Things are going to happen. And so that, that multi-layer approach to make sure that it's not just, you're not just locking the front door. You're locking the front door, and then you have you know, keys to the different cabinets, and then you have a, a safe in the basement, that sort of thing. And that resiliency is what's going to allow you to keep the diapers running off the right. Yeah, it's a defense by depth. I, I think about kind of my kids. I've got 10-year-old twins. Um, I can't keep them safe from everything. I just can't. I'd love to. Um, I'd love to wrap them in bubble wrap and, and do that. But at some point in time, they have to be resilient. I need them to be an extension of me. You have to think about your staff that way. You have to think about your people, your processes, your technology that way. But you got to start by keeping them safe. But you're, you got to plan for when it's not. I have to plan for when my kids are going to be out into a, the world and they have to make decisions for themselves. So I, I think we can learn a lot from some of the, um, the, the personal things that we all deal with for sure. Go ahead, Wayne back. So, so when you go through this, I think a lot of it be, I'll say from an end user perspective or on a manufacturing floor, I think in the room we have a variety of value that we sell as an OEM and system integrator that we can have over. And is there any best practices uh, or industry trends that you're seeing from that perspective as they work with their end user community? <laughs> Yeah, actually, there, there's one that I'm seeing more and more is OEMs thinking about, frankly, I'll just say it, how they monetize cybersecurity. So how can they hand their end user a machine, a process, something different, but it's already secure. It's already built in the framework. They understand the end user's uh, security journey. They understand the end user's SOC, for instance, and they know that their machine will show up ready to plug into whatever that is with the right network layout, the right endpoint protection, the right security threats, it's ready to go. I, and I think that's really intriguing. That's really tough to do because not all end users have, uh, you know, uh, I'll say uh, a good understanding of their own threat landscape. But as OEMs, that's a, that's a compelling thing. It's no different than what we did with performance and safety as an OEM, uh, you know, years ago. We would understand the end user requirements and we'd be able to say we meet those with this standard approach. Security can be thought of the same way. And you can use partners in the same way. I mean, if you work with the end user's partner to understand their threat landscape, you can then work upstream and think about how you have to change your OEM's machine, your, your approach to dovetail into the end user. So that's one trend we're, we're seeing a lot of. OEM's asking us for help to, to be ready for the different security requirements that end users are thrusting upon them. And they actually want to get ahead of it and say, look, we can actually help you uh, decrease your threat landscape, increase your security hygiene if you work with us. It's a, a strategy, a monetization strategy, and I think a really good one. So that's definitely a trend we're seeing. Going once, twice. Thanks for the time, everyone. Appreciate it.